in um, in the States. It's quite early in the morning. And, and good afternoon, uh, other colleagues. So my name is uh, uh, Mustafa Sani Jalab. Uh, I'm uh, working with WTO Secretariat uh, in Geneva, particularly on knowledge management divisions and dealing with academic outreach uh, section and, and activities. I would be extremely pleased to share uh, this uh, session uh, today. Uh, I'm also lucky to uh, have uh, uh, with me for um, this session uh, two friends, but also, I mean, two colleagues, but also two friends. Um, first, uh, Dr. Martin Smith, uh, who used to be until very recently a WTO colleague, and now, uh, uh, I mean, uh, he has finished his time with WTO and doing other uh, intense academic activities, particularly with the University of St. Petersburg, but also with other universities. Uh, so, uh, Martin, uh, uh, welcome and thank you for being with us. This session was initially organized together with also uh, Dr. Uh, Nassim Ouman, who is uh, uh, the chief uh, of the Blue and Green uh, section in the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. So also, uh, uh, Nassim is uh, a well-known uh, expert, a scholar, but also a civil staff working on uh, regional trade integration, particularly on blue and green economy, and uh, very much uh, involved uh, on building back better strategies in Africa now. So I think that the session we have uh, today is extremely incremental. And thank you, Nassim, for being with us and also for uh, representing as well as CA uh, in, in this important uh, uh, session. Uh, the topic is uh, about uh, uh, building forward better and the role of trade to support resilient and, and green economy. Uh, but we can say green and blue economy because we know that blue economy is also something extremely important uh, to reduce uh, uh, economic vulnerabilities or uh, let's say yes. Uh, vulnerabilities at some countries, particularly small island developing states, but also other countries with uh, uh, island cost uh, have been um, facing during uh, the last uh, period. So for this session, uh, we'll have uh, three uh, papers representing three chairs, uh, maybe one word about the chairs program and the academic program at WTO, the chairs program supports uh, I mean, uh, um, developing specific capacities, trade related capacities for uh, miniature. So we have uh, uh, three chairs representing today, the chair from uh, Oman, Sultan Khabos University, the chair from Tunisia, uh, Tunis Business School, and we also have uh, the chair from Benin. Uh, I don't know yet if Charlemagne or Boris are connected, but I think they are going to be with us uh, during the session with University Abome Kalavi. So just maybe to present the three uh, uh, experts we, 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 we have with us uh, today. Uh, so, uh, first, uh, I can see uh, Insaf Gedidi from, from Tunisia. So, uh, thank you, Insaf, for being with us. Uh, she's going to present a paper on uh, CO2 emissions, environmental provisions, and global value chains in the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, then we are going to have uh, Abdullah Akintola from Sultan Qaboos University, and he's going to make a presentation about the impact of uh, NTBs or non-tariff measures in the Indian Ocean Rim Association, and more particularly providing a CG uh, approach to uh, provide uh, empirical evidences about this, this impact. Uh, and then uh, the, the last paper, uh, hopefully from uh, the chair from, from Benin, about removing market constraints and small orders adaptation to, to, to climate change. So, uh, before moving forward, it's my pleasure uh, quickly to give the floor to uh, Dr. Martin Smith, who can say uh, just maybe uh, some introductory words, and then we can uh, directly start with uh, uh, Insaf. Martin, over to you, please. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mustafa. But uh, to be honest, I don't want to take too much time from the presenters and the discussion that we hope to have. I, I'm just very appreciative uh, and grateful to the chairs to the three chairs that have contributed to this uh, session and that have done excellent paper and I think uh, bringing in some no novelty elements into the debate about the environmental provisions in GVCs and the issue of uh, the food systems uh, by Bénin 
and of course also the regional perspectives offer, offered by Oman. So I think there's some very interesting new elements just to bring out and to put on the record that um, we have had excellent cooperation with all the chairs uh, and Mustafa and Nassim, they have done excellent work in making sure that the chairs uh, have produced uh, the kind of quality papers and work that we see today. And I'm very happy to know that um, just before my departure from the WTO, we managed to uh, launch the phase three of the chairs program, at least to undertake the selection, which is now uh, very much in the hands of uh, Mustafa. And again, he's doing a great job. So I'm confident that next year we'll have more uh, chairs contributing to the GTAP conference. Uh, I hope so. And with those words, I just want to leave it and, uh, and give a chance to the presenters to present their findings and to have, it, have more time for discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Mustafa. No, thank you very much, Martin. I think it was also important to, to have you involved during this session because you have been so uh, incremental and, uh, uh, let me say, also uh, incredibly uh, fantastic to support the uh, academic community, uh, not only in Africa, but in the world. And I think it was also uh, a nice way to give the, the tribute uh, you deserve as well to, 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 to your uh, hard work and, and, and strong involvement in the development of capacities, uh, not only in Africa, but also in, in, in all the regions of the world. So thank you very much, Martin, for uh, your great commitment and also the great commitment that you are going to provide now, because I know you are very much involved with other universities. So thank you, Martin, for, 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 for all what you have, you have done. Um, so without any transition, let me now give the floor to uh, Insaf Gelidi from uh, Tunisia, and she's going to make the, uh, I mean, uh, Insaf is from uh, the IO School uh, of Economic and Commercial Science of Tunis, University of Tunis, working closely with uh, Dr. Professor Laila Baghdadi. Uh, so uh, Insaf, uh, uh, over to you. I mean, uh, you can take maybe 15, 20 minutes, but uh, take your time to make your presentation. I think we, we, are, in a, uh, we are among ourselves. Uh, so please uh, uh, take your time and 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 uh, you can go uh, forward with your presentation. Over to you, Insaf. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, as we all know, that global value chains and participation of countries in global value chains is increasing. And nowadays, we are speaking about um, the role of multinationals in global value chains, and also about vertical integration and global networks. So it could be, it is actually very important to study um, um, the implications of, um, of global value chain participation and also what is the impact of global value chains on environmental um, sustainability. So the motivation behind this work is that um, in global value chains, the product crosses border many times. So um, in the traditional way of moving the product from origin to destination, we, uh, we use, for example, one um, uh, like less uh, transportation and infrastructure, but in the era of global value chains, we are using more uh, infrastructure, more international flight transport. And um, we, uh, in this study, air pollution coming from international flight transport could increase by 160% by 2015. And this may be explained by um, the participation and engagement of countries in global value chains. Also, uh, one study about NAFTA indicates that in the first five years, um, NAFTA reduces emissions of pollutants by two thirds in the United States. So we might wonder what's the role of um, signing more trade agreements in uh, um, international trade and global value chains and the impact of signing more trade agreements uh, on um, uh, on the environment and also uh, if we go deeper and um, we see the laws and the provisions in these uh, trade agreements and its um, role in, uh, in pollution, in uh, shaping the pollution in the world. So here um, carbon emissions were shifted from uh, developing to developing, from developing to developing countries. So um, this is explained by the fact that countries differently implement environmental laws. And um, uh, we set an example that uh, China's trade openness increases actually carbon emissions. And the effect of uh, trade on the environment varies depending on the country, its engagement in global value chains, and on the pollutant or the sector 
where they have comparative advantage. So the research question would be, what is the impact of global value chains in terms of sexual forward and backward linkages on carbon emissions in the presence of regional trade agreements with environmental provisions? Uh, here, so, uh, the environmental effect of trade openings could differ. It could be, um, it could be uh, good, it could be bad. So, depending uh, on the country, depending on the number of provisions and trade agreements, whether these provisions are uh, stringent or, or not. And also, um, international trade in intermediates actually rises domestic carbon emissions in developing countries. Um, the importance of trade agreements with environmental provisions were, um, was discussed in many, many um, um, scientific papers. So here um, uh, we have the relationship between pollution and trade agreements was discussed in um, Church Pension and Diawel. And then we go deeper into what is included in the trade agreements. Um, so, uh, and this was discussed in uh, Zoo, uh, Baghdadi and uh, Martinez Zarzoso. We may wonder what are uh, the, um, uh, we may ask, uh, what are the channels through which global value chains could harm or benefit the environment? So the first uh, thing that we define is the participation global value chains benefits the countries from co competition and technique effects. So uh, competition and technique effects is that uh, when we participate more in global value chains, then um, the product, uh, the eco-friendly product is becoming less um, expensive. So this is a good thing um, that we may have uh, through uh, our participation in global value chains. However, uh, what we call growth or scale effect, which means uh, expansion and the, and the um, economic activity, but in the early stages of participation in global value chains could harm the environment because we have more products than uh, more energy consumption and then more carbon emissions. The second channel that we define is that um, the product in global value chains is um, crossing the border many, many times. And it's then in this case, uh, we make use of more infrastructure and more uh, carbon um, and more um, transportation. And uh, another thing that um, migration of industries in countries with weak environmental protection is becoming a major concern in global value chains as firms and multinational they shape or they uh, migrate towards countries with lenient um, environmental laws. And here we can um, state two main concepts, uh, which are the carbon leakage. It means that uh, countries, they relocate in countries uh, with less, with uh, less costly uh, environmental protection um, policies. And also uh, we can, we may speak about the pollution haven hypothesis, which means that, um, uh, industries are becoming uh, like dirty industries are um, migrating towards uh, countries with lenient environmental policies, and those kind of countries are becoming the, like the, the pollution haven. So um, the paper examines the empirical relations between trade and the environment in the MENA region uh, during 19, uh, uh, 1990 till 2015. So why the MENA region? It's because uh, it's very important as most of the MENA region countries are developing countries. So uh, we may um, know, um, we may check like the, the impact of different sectors in global value chains um, and their impact on the uh, environment. Uh, second, uh, this paper explores the impact of forward and backward linkages on pollution, taking into consideration participation by sector. Um, and it analyzes the effect of RTAs with environmental provisions and integration on carbon emissions using the gravity model. So um, we make use of uh, global value chains indicators, which are which are calculated as uh, we may see. So we have the global value chain participation index is um, uh, equals to the forward global value chain index plus the backward participation global value chain index. And each is calculated for, for the forward one is calculated based on the indirect value added um, 
over uh, the gross exports time uh, 100. So uh, and it's an index in percentage. And the backward one, we use uh, data of foreign value added uh, over the gross exports times 100. So we get the uh, what we call DVX and FVR, the indirect value added and the foreign value added from this representation. So we have gross exports. So um, nowadays we no more speak about gross exports and the traditional way of trade uh, flows, but rather we speak about value added um, activities and value added flows. So here we have the gross exports are divided into two subsections. So we have the foreign value added, which is exports of imported intermediates. And here uh, it is considered like the backward linkages. So uh, when the country imports value added, it intervenes in the, uh, the last uh, in the um, last stages of the value chain. And for the domestic value added, we have um, it is um, um, classified into exported as final goods. So we export final goods, or we export final <clears throat> sorry final goods that will um, be uh, re, uh, that will be re-imported again to the same country. And then we have the export uh, intermediates that uh, is um, um, consumed at the uh, partner country. And we have the other definition of global value chain participation which is exportation of value added that will be re-exported uh, again to a third partner. So as here, the definition we take of global value chain indicators is that at minimum, three countries are involved in the value chain, whether we import from one country to export to a third one, or uh, whether we export to uh, a second country that will be exported to a third one. So here in the value chain, we have three uh, countries at, at, minimum, at least. So the data we use is carbon emissions, um, the uh, usual uh, use data and the gravity model, um, and um, RTAs um, with environmental provisions, RTAs with no environmental provisions as the dummy variable exists or does not exist. And we use as a proxy for institutional quality government uh, effectiveness and indicators by sector of forward and backward participation, I, I, as I exactly explained in the, um, in the two previous slides. So um, the gravity model was used uh, in other um, uh, researchers, um, by other researchers um, for carbon emissions and water exports. So not only in the trade, but also it could be used in those cases. And um, in the data, we have 20 million countries uh, emitting pollution, emitting carbon and pollution. And the estimated uh, equation is um, this based on the government effectiveness, uh, forward and backward participation, and uh, um, RTAs with and without, and their interaction to see if this exists, what is the impact of this on, uh, on the carbon emissions. So here, uh, the, uh, the usual uh, used variables of the gravity model, so GDP, contiguity, language, colony, distance, etc. And now we go to the estimations. So here, I'm not sure if this is clear or not, but here we have in the first and the second uh, column for Robson's track, we use the OLS estimation, and we use the third and the third and the fourth column, the fixed effect estimates. So here we have, um, um, we, we notice that the government effectiveness decreases carbon emissions and environmental loads generally they increase uh, the RTAs uh, with no environmental loads, they increase carbon emissions and RTAs with no, um, in here, for example, when we have government effectiveness in the presence of RTAs with environmental loads, this is insignificant in the case, in this case, um, in most cases, however, RTAs with no environmental provisions, uh, where when we have government effectiveness at the destination country, it decreases carbon emissions. See here for the high tech manufacturing, so we classify um, um, classify participation forward and backward global value chains by sector. We have the high manufacturing sectors, uh, low tech manufacturing sectors, and we have the primary sectors. So the, for the forward um, um, for the uh, for, uh, forward participation in global value chains in high tech manufacturing sectors, we have um, a negative uh, impact or insignificant impact depends on the estimation. So we may say that it's a negative impact 
on carbon emissions. Uh, for RTAs with uh, no environmental laws, uh, it is uh, negative for uh, both and with environmental laws. So in high-tech manufacturing sector, um, RTAs with no uh, with environmental laws, it decreases carbon emissions. And here for the low-tech manufacturing sectors, we have um, we have that participation in global value chains in those sectors. Actually, it increases um, carbon emissions. And when uh, we have um, RTAs with uh, no environmental uh, with environmental provisions, it decreases carbon emissions. So here, uh, when signing environmental um, when signing RTAs with environmental provisions. Uh, we could decrease carbon emissions in forward low-tech manufacturing sectors. For the primary sectors, so in primary sectors, uh, when many countries they participate in forward uh, linkages, they um, they they uh, they don't have much impact um, on uh, carbon emissions on like on pollution, and here. In the uh, for backward the global value chain uh, participation, uh, we have uh, in high tech manufacturing sectors we have like high tech manufacturing sectors in backward participation in our regions they increase carbon emissions, and uh, even though uh, we sign RTAs it does not have the thus environmental impact on the, uh, on, the, on pollution. For the low tech manufacturing sectors. So um, low-tech manufacturing sectors, they decrease carbon em emissions. And um, for the uh, existence of the environmental, of, of, of RTAs, whether with or without environmental laws, it could uh, decrease um, carbon emissions. So here, uh, low-tech manufacturing sectors, it increases pollution. If we sign more RTAs with environmental provisions, it could decrease environmental um, uh, the, um, the pollution. For primary sectors in backward participation, so uh, here we have high impact on uh, pollution. For um, um, the same thing goes when we have presence of RTAs with and without environmental provisions at the, the first analysis of the uh, of the uh, low tech manufacturing sectors. So here uh, the main result that we draw is that RTAs uh, increase carbon emissions. And RTAs with, um, so this is a general, but it could differ from one sector to another. So uh, RTAs increase carbon emissions, uh, and RTAs with environmental provisions could reduce carbon emissions in many region, in upstream low tech manufacturing sectors, and in downstream low tech manufacturing and primary sectors. So here we could say that low-tech manufacturing sectors, whether the participation is forward or backward, it has a negative impact on the environment. And we, if we sign more RTAs with environmental provisions, this reduces the pollution. And um, here um, we have two studies that, sh that shows that RTAs without environmental provisions have air quality or quality. Uh, in low-income countries, suffer from pollution even after signing more FTA due to lenient environmental standards. So this is we may explain why in the other sectors um, we don't have that that much impact of the lenient of uh, provisions on uh, the participation in global budgets. So here um, about the sectoral aspect of global budget, uh, forward and backward. So, uh, sectoral aspect matters for many countries when we evaluate the impact of global value chain participation of, on environmental quality. So, in this paper, we prove that um, the type of the uh, of the uh, of the task that the country is performing uh, in global value chains does matter. Uh, if you want to understand the importance of signing more RTAs with environmental provisions on um, on the pollution. And uh, multinational, this is explained by the fact that multinational firms are reported in developing countries perform their polluting activities in countries with relatively weak environmental laws. Moreover, developing countries execute tasks in high polluting industries. And as we say, uh, as we, um, we showed that um, generally there are low tech manufacturing sectors, so less services, less services in the, uh, in the uh, value chain.
and um, good gover governance of institutions in the mineral region decrease carbon emissions. So environmental provisions in MENA does not directly contribute to environmental quality, even with institutional quality is ensured. This supports the findings of law. Uh, they show that a high level of institutional quality makes trade openness beneficial to the environment in sub um, Sahara Africa. Uh, the conclusions um, from uh, this paper is that the environment suffers uh, deterioration when MENA countries engage to upstream low-tech manufacturing sectors and downstream high-tech manufacturing sectors. So upstream, it means they produce inputs to other countries. And downstream, it means they, are, they make use of um, um, other countries' inputs in high-tech manufacturing to produce uh, more... Um, um, more um, products. So here uh, we may um, say in the downstream, like inputs of from the textile um, sector, so are more polluting. Uh, they they are um, they have high pollution on the environment and primary sectors as well, like the agriculture, etc. So um, this study helps identify to which extent negotiating environmental policies in the MENA region is important for green sustainability. It is very important to, um, to discuss, um, first of all, to understand um, the position uh, of the MENA countries in uh, the global and the global production networks. Uh, what is the type of sector that is participating more? And based on this, we may understand that how, to what extent um, global value chain participation could decrease, um, could have a bad impact on the environment. So uh, now uh, the impact of pollution, actually, this is like the final thing to, to say about the paper is that the impact of pollution is global. Uh, it's true that in this study, we are, um, we are uh, trying to understand um, the role of mineral region in terms of, um, in terms of uh, like international contributor to the pollution in the world, but pollution is global. Pollution, um, it impacts the earth, um, the earth as the world, whether the country is um, developed or developing, in, and whether the country is the consumer or the emitter. Because here we are trying to, to analyze the role of mineral region as the consumer, but we know that also there is a, a very important role of the, um, of the other country who are consuming. It's like they are um, receiving those pollutions. And uh, we call for a serious coordination in terms of respecting the implementation of environmental laws, um, whether you are a producer of a country, uh, a producer of a product or an emitter uh, of a, or um, producing a so called of a product in your location or in other location, you're still responsible. So uh, uh, thank you very much. I hope I have 15 minutes, I guess, I spent. In South, no, thank you, thank you very much. I think it has been extremely comprehensive and uh, very much detailed. Uh, so I, I may come back because I also have some some question comments on your very uh, interesting and promising research. Uh, it was a little bit more than fifteen minutes, but it's okay. Uh, uh, I will I will give the floor uh, to 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 my colleague and friend uh, Nassim for his review, uh, and then uh, we'll have we can have a quick. Uh, uh, I mean, a uh, session to see if some colleagues want to, to raise questions or not. But before that, Nassim, please, go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mustafa. Thank you, Insart, for, for this uh, very clear and interesting presentation. Uh, and uh, the paper is very interesting. interesting. This paper investigates the relationship between carbon emissions, environmental provisions in RTAs and GVCs, using a, a panel uh, data gravity model for the Middle East and North Africa region over the period 1990 uh, to 2015. I particularly appreciated the multidimensional and multisectoral uh, GVCs approach of the paper. The authors found that uh, RTAs had positive effect on uh, carbon emissions. Countries belonging to the same RTA with environmental laws have 
converge CO2 emissions. And the paper highlights the, the complexity impact of the GVC landscape in a region like the Lena region. And the, import, the, really the importance to better understand this GVC landscape to be able to, to, to set suitable RTAs with environmental provisions in order to reduce the uh, pollution and contribute to contribute to sustainable uh, upgrading in G GVCs. So indeed, it, it is a reminder that it is not clear whether joining global production networks in terms of forward participation and backward participation in specific sectors, in specific sectors, increases or decreases environmental degradation. Without surprise, the paper found that good governance of institutions in the MENA region decreases carbon footprint, and that taken globally RTAs increase carbon emissions. The results uh, of this uh, study show that government effectiveness decreases pollution in MENA emitter of, uh, of CO2 and increases pollution to destination countries, the consumers uh, of CO2. In other words, environmental quality is ensured when the country which originates CO2 has good quality of institutions. These results are easy to explain. However, what is less evident to explain and perhaps require from the author more investigations is why good quality institutions in the country receiving CO2 increases pollution originated elsewhere. So this is something perhaps to, 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 to explore, uh, to, to further explore. An interesting result is that when we distinguish between upstream and downstream and among sectors, the results show that RTAs with environmental provisions could reduce carbon emissions in MENA region in upstream low-tech manufacturing sectors and in downstream uh, LTM and, the, and primary sector. So the paper confirm uh, also that upstream tasks in GVC do not contribute to environmental deterioration except for, uh, for low-tech uh, manufacturing sector, food, textiles, and wearing apparel, this kind of, of sectors, with the specialization of developing countries on tasks in high polluting industries, uh, in high polluting industries, that could be explained by, by the fact that multinational firms headquarters headquartered perform their uh, polluting activities in country with a relatively weak environmental lo laws. So the paper confirms then that for MENA, con MENA countries, at least, uh, environmental provisions in the preferential trade agreements has, they, they, they have a significant impact in these sectors, in the low-tech low manufacturing, and is an important lever for po po pollution reduction. So, if the paper confirms that forward GVC's participation in low-tech manufacturing sectors deteriorates the environment, the fact that backward trade linkages of MENA countries in low-tech manufacturing sectors do not harm the environment, the environment illustrates this complexity, the complexity of the link between trade, net networks production, and environmental pollution. So at least for MENA countries, I think that this paper will gain a lot in developing a dashboard to translate these results into policy options in terms of environmental provisions versus institutional quality improvement. It is very clear in the paper that it's not always depending on the, 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 the sectors, depending on the, the, the backward or, or, or dimension or not. You have different reasons. So the, uh, a simple, uh, simple, a simple um, dashboard, uh, you know, basic with colors, green, uh, uh, yellow, and uh, brown, uh, will really illustrate perfectly your results and will give policy options. Uh, will give policy options uh, 
based on your results. And then, but what would be important also is to, 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 to clarify if these results are, 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 um, are specific to the MENA region, region or if we find the same kind of results for other regions. So it means that it's more sector specific results, which, uh, and then, you know, the, the, the policies could be quite a little bit different depending on uh, the specificity to the region or to the, 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 to the sector. From an African perspective, as we have the uh, uh, ISCFTA, the Continental Free Trade Ag uh, Agreement, that doesn't include any, any environmental provision, but strongly supported the development of regional value chains, it will be then interesting for the authors to explore further the contiguity and distance dimension that is in your results. Indeed, across the continent at the sub-regional level with the regional economic communities, African countries, they have a strong sub-regional institutional framework that could play a major role in environmental regulatory convergence and then on support regional value chains that are crucial for small economies facing important natural constraints, and then could have, could, could have a, a, a very strong impact on, 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 on the pollution. So, Isaf, uh, thank you very much. It was uh, very nice, uh, and thanks to the uh, to, to, to Leila uh, also. It was a very interesting uh, paper, and thank you for your very clear uh, presentation. Over to thank you. you. Thank you very much, Nassim, for this uh, extremely detailed and comprehensive uh, remarks, uh, not only at the technical level, but also from, from a policy uh, and practical perspective. I think it's, it's very much useful indeed. Uh, I don't know if there is additional comments on, on this paper or questions. Uh, uh, if so, please, you can just raise your hand or, or on the chat box. And Martin, I can see you want to say something. Martin, please go ahead. No, I, I, I like very much the paper and I very much uh, like your presentation and also Nassim's comments. And actually, as I was listening, I was writing down some comments and questions. Um, but uh, Nassim kind of um, anticipated them. And I think these are the questions one would like to uh, know more about. Like, to what extent do your findings uh, will your findings likely influence policy either at the national or the regional level or, as Nassim rightly said, are these conclusions perhaps to be drawn at a more general overall level? And what can you draw from that? To what extent will this affect or influence uh, attracting foreign direct investment? To what extent will it influence governments to decide yes for this business, no for that business, and to what extent does it um, impact the uh, global value chains decision-making model in the sense that we always keep on saying that you want to move up the ladder of uh, GVC, so you want to go to the high end of the uh, value, add, value addition process. To what, can, can we draw policy conclusions in that sense and, and tell governments you're better off uh, number one, like you clearly say, signing off on environmental agreements, that's number one, so that you can cleaner uh, business activities. And number two, we want to uh, attract uh, certain business activities and eliminate others. And then the next question, uh, which would be interesting to investigate in my view, is that with the findings and the conclusions that you have drawn, when you uh, look at your own economy or maybe the economies in the uh, MENA region, what is the conclusion you can draw from that? Are the economic activities and the policies conducted compatible with your findings or does it require adjustment in the industrial policies? These are very open and wide questions. They are not easy to answer, but what I like to always uh, focus on is when you do uh, the kind of research that you have undertaken, how do you translate that into policy action? Uh, and what are the implications? It's a bit wide what I'm asking. You don't need to answer all these questions right now, but I think it's something that is worth thinking through um, in the next stage. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, indeed, uh, very uh, interesting questions, particularly on uh, FDI, how to attract FDI in uh, green oriented sectors and how uh, it could also contribute to uh, uh, generate uh, value addition, uh, both in exports, but also in, 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 in job employment. I think there's something also important to, 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 to relate this aspect to uh, diversification and job creation. Um, I don't see any additional questions. So if that's the case, I will kindly ask INSAF maybe to, to uh, provide some, let's say, um, feedbacks or contributions to, to the comments uh, made by both uh, Nassim and, and, and Martin. INSAF, please. So, um, yes, I think that um, the question is global and there is a lot of questions and um, like uh, policy actions that need to, um, to be addressed. Uh, so, um, I think that um, for, for, um, for developing countries and especially the countries that I have uh, studied, it's a quite uh, complex. For example, engagement for, of North Africa in global value chains uh, is not the same as uh, the Middle East. So it differs in sectors, uh, it differs in, uh, in the way they are engaged, whether forward or backward. So if we say forward, it means of exploitation of value added, which um, contributes actually to itself to the GDP. Because if the country um, exports value added that is uh, generated domestically, it means, um, it means uh, GD good GDP, welfare, etc. And if it is engaged in the backward participation, part Participation means it, it imports to export, which is less um, contribution to, to GDP. So there is a lot of questions that we may draw. And probably it's more interesting to focus on one country because um, um, like uh, each country has its specificities. So it's very important to understand the landscape, global, the global value chain at the sectoral level in one country uh, to, to be able to, um, to, uh, to give like um, to give the good advices to uh, to the community. I try to be brief. No, thank you very much, Insaf. I think, uh, yes, you're right. There's a lot of um, heterogeneities across uh, MENA region and what is maybe true for Morocco is maybe not for other countries in the region and vice versa. And, and as you and also Nasi mentioned that Middle East and North Africa is a quite heterogeneous uh, region both in terms of specialization and also contribution of the services sector in the GDP, but also uh, on the, uh, the, the, the trading goods uh, um, contribution in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the growth um, contribution. So, yeah, uh, uh, there's also this aspect of FDI and green FDI. I think it's also interesting maybe as a follow-up uh, to see from your uh, work uh, where are the sectors where FDI could be much more, you know, uh, identified and contribute to build, you know, a new kind of, of, of uh, uh, diversification, but also specialization. Uh, because I think that one interest of your paper, if I may say so, is also to recall that uh, uh, being specialized is also something which could be good. If this specialization, you know, has some impact, you know, in terms of building uh, uh, capacities and also contributing, you know, uh, to, to 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 diversify in 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 the longer term. So uh, I think I think that it has some some incentives as well, and it would be good also to get maybe more uh, a policy recommendation, particularly on the CFTA. You mentioned the CFTA, but there's also the uh, the, the, the the global, you know. A trade agreement across Arab countries in the MENA region. Uh, I think it's a, it's a GAFTA, if I remember correctly. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe also try to separate in your work some some dummies, for instance, to get what could be the impact for the CFTA for uh, uh, North African countries, which are also part of the uh, CFTA. But also there is the the the, the GAFTA for uh, the the Arab countries, the Middle East countries. And what are also the impact of this RTA? Because I do suspect that the impact and the magnitude of the results are quite different according to the RTS and according to uh, the countries. So we may have some some uh, specific effects 
at the country level, but also at the Rex level. And uh, I, I, I do think that this needs to be controlled in your in your empirical work. Uh, I also have two additional maybe comments. It's not question. It's much more comments for 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 your paper and for the way forward. Um, you mentioned that low income countries suffer uh, from uh, pollution even more after FTEA. Uh, I think it would be maybe interesting in, if you could provide some evidences about you know. Uh, income distribution in your paper and to capture also the magnitude of, you know, income distribution uh, uh, due to uh, environmental regulations and what kind of, you know, compensation mechanism uh, a short country need to put in place in order to mitigate the impact of uh, those regulations in terms of uh, a trade liberalization. I think that there is something interesting here. To, to, to say and the narrative maybe could uh, be uh, developed in line with the paper from uh, law 2016 that you mentioned in your conclusion when uh, you mentioned some 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 also uh, impact both uh, at the upstream and and downstream you know uh, sector this also raised my last comment in terms of uh, uh, diversification but much more horizontal versus vertical diversification and i think maybe it will be quite relevant and and useful to have some diversification index in your work to see if uh, uh, environmental regulation have an impact uh, when we talk about horizontal diversification or vertical diversification and what are also the impact in terms of upstream and downstream sectors particularly when we talk about intra branch uh, products and exports, but this will require to have access to very specific database. And my suggestion maybe is to do more uh, technical work at the country level uh, to get, you know, some also, uh, 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 let's say, positive recommendation in line with the dashboard that Nassim was mentioning about, you know, the various colors, the blue, green, and yellow. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Insaf, for for your uh, yeah. Uh, maybe what what ja, I, I I see that you want to. to, to I I to, just to, wanted okay. to point out we're running off schedule a little bit, uh, but since we're missing our third presenter, I haven't said anything. But in case he shows up, we're gonna have to rush it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I have endogenized this aspect in uh, the uh, moderation of okay. the session because I have been in contact with the chair from Benin and colleague from Benin, but they do not hang up my calls. Uh, so okay. if so, um, uh, I have taken the, the latitude to give more time to INSAF and also to a participant to to, to uh, raise questions and also uh, to take some liberty uh, from my side uh, okay. to uh, be much more, uh, let's say, vocal in, uh, in this presentation. So thank you uh, very much, INSAF. And I think without any trans and thank you also, Wadja, for uh, bringing uh, this uh, dimension. I know that you are the uh, uh, the timekeeper uh, and and very much, you know, concerned about, you know, um, time arrangements, uh, given the fact that we are running several sessions, you know, uh, in parallel. So thank you very much, INSAF, and also please extend our appreciation and satisfaction to your colleagues from the chair in Tunisia, but also to your colleague there. So thank you very much for your great work and very uh, uh, interesting, you know, contribution uh, on uh, to the literature on, on trade and environment. Um, without any transition, it's my pleasure now to give the floor to uh, Abdallah Akintola, who is working closely with Professor uh, uh, Hussein uh, Bugnami from uh, uh, the chair of uh, Sultan Kabos in Oman. So we are now moving from Tunisia to Oman, thanks to the technology, which is uh, something uh, that I understand from Martin is very familiar now. So great. Uh, so uh, Abdullah, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, uh, you are going uh, to uh, talk uh, about also the same kind of uh, related issue, more particularly uh, how uh, NTMs, non-tariff measures, uh, could impact uh, uh, the Indian Ocean Rim Association uh, using CGE approach. I know you are, you are going to use the GTAP model. Uh, so please, uh, Abdullah, the floor is yours. And the same rule applies to you as well. I think you can take up to 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes to make your presentation. So please take your time. Uh, 
and uh, then we'll, 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 we'll go to, 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 to our uh, discussant and participant to, to get some, some insight and questions or comments about your presentation. So, Abdullah, please, floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, I hope you can see my screen now. Yeah, we can see it and we can hear you. So please, yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Okay. So good day, everyone. And uh, I'll be presenting our research on the impact of non-tariff measures in the Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, using uh, a CG. So like he said, presenting to me is Abdullah Nira Akintola, a PhD student from Sultan Kabus uh, University. So I'll quickly take us through, I'm trying to navigate to the next slide. Okay, I'll quickly take us through some quick facts about uh, IORA. Then I'll talk about the NCMs, the tariff and trade facilitation uh, situations in the region. Then I'll also talk about the methodology we made use of and uh, discuss some results and thus bring up some uh, modeling issues. So IORA was established in 1997, starting with uh, seven magnificent, magnificent countries. And later on, it has grew, it grew up to 14 countries. And later on, it grew up to 23 countries, with France being the newest uh, member. And it joined through the Reunion Island, which is an overseas territory of the Indian Ocean uh, Rim Association. So IORA region, uh, IORA association has uh, a diverse background in terms of economic, geographical, and uh, its uh, resource endowments. We can see a country like uh, Singapore having as a very high GDP per capita of around 58,000 US dollar. And we could see a country like Mozambique having a GDP per capita of around for an oil of 55 US dollar. We could also see in terms of population, a huge uh, population base of around 1.4 billion in India. And we could see uh, the lowest of around 100,000 people in Seychelles. Uh, Australia is the largest in terms of area and Maldives is the lowest in terms of area. So uh, in recent years, we, we could see an increase in the contribution of IORA countries to the world GDP and uh, trade. The GDP, the contribution for exports and imports of IORA has risen to around 12%. And also we could see the contribution to the world GDP has been around 9% in the recent years. IORA uh, region accounts for half of the world ship containers and two thirds of the watch shipments pass through the region. The region has, has been a trade nexus connecting different parts of the world. And it is based on the principles of open regionalism, just like the association, uh, the Asian uh, Economic Association as well, which uh, allows countries to engage in bilateral agreements. And also the IORA comprises of emerging economies such as India, Tanzania, and Bangladesh. So despite no legal framework like uh, the IORA, because every country no common tariff and the likes, the intra trade within the region has been uh, high as far as like getting up to 30% in recent time. But several studies have shown that this uh, high, uh, or let's say appreciable level of intra-trade is due to the sub-regional groupings in the region. And the studies have suggested that there should be, to, to en enhance the benefits from the association, there should be a deeper integration where there is a tariff cut and there is a reduction in the NCMs. So this has been some of the focus of uh, our study. 
to look at what would uh, the Indian Association gain when it involves a deeper integration as opposed to the open regionalism which it presently operates now. So based on the numbers of notifications uh, by the IORA to the WTO, we could see that the technical barriers to trade is the largest, followed by the uh, SPS, which is sanitary, sanit sanitary and phytosanitary measures. And it is quite still surprising that we have a lot of quantitative restrictions measures still in place in the region. And we could see that uh, com uh, considering the total amount of notifications to WTO, IORA reports about 19, about 18 percent of the total notification. SPS makes a uh, letter chunk of the uh, of the notifications, and around 46.6 percent of the total notification to WTO in IORA comes from the agricultural uh, sector. So in the, the, the tariff regimes in the region is also diverse. We have countries such as uh, Iran and Sri Lanka having a very high tariff, uh, average tariff rate of 16%. And we could see a country like Singapore having a very low tariff of about 1.2%. So moving on, based on the trade facilitation indicators developed by the OECD, we could see that most of the countries in the high income group, such as Australia, Mauritius, Oman, and Singapore, were the best, best performer except for the United Arab Emirates, UAE. So we could also notice that countries in the lower middle and lower income group performed below average. These uh, are part of the reasons why we looked at uh, the NTM's removal and uh, trade facilitation. Because when you talk about NTM removal, indirectly, we are also talking about trade facilitation. So based on the ranking within the region, we could see that Singapore, Australia, and Oman are among the top three performers, while Yemen and Comoros are the least performers. So like most of the studies done in this, uh, on the Indian Ocean Association, they focused on regional trade integration, mainly uh, using a tariff cut scenarios. And most of the studies have just been using a static model. So uh, in, our, in our own case, we, made, we made, made use of two scenarios. The first scenario is talking about regional trade with a, with a tariff cut, with a gradual tariff cut over 10 years. And also we, we looked at the second scenario, combining the first scenario with an NTM reduction and a trade facilitation aspect to it. We aggregated our, our, that, our countries and sectors to 31 based on relevance to uh, Indian Ocean Rim Association. We made use of a dynamic model, the run DINA, uh, also developed by Digital. So from the welfare, we could see that all, all, all most of the countries had a welfare gain. But it's, uh, we could see that countries like Sri Lanka and Kenya, the welfare gain was very, very high compared to others. However, some countries like Bangladesh, uh, Ma uh, Ma uh, Ma Mozambique, Tanzania had a welfare loss. But if we look closely, we would see that the countries which had a welfare loss, the welfare loss was less impactful when uh, there is a NTM removal and trade facilitation is considered. So moving on to the uh, GDP growth, we could see that all, all, all the countries on, uh, under, the, under the shop, which is uh, the IR countries, had an increase in their GDP. However, a country like Iran had a, a less, uh, uh, had a negative growth in its uh, GDP. But you could see that the, the, the GDP was uh, growth was better of compared in the second scenario, which involves NCM removal and uh, the tariff uh, and trade facilitation. So going further, we based it on income group. We could say that the the we could say that lower middle income and low income countries group had a uh, more 
more GDP growth, increase in the GDP growth compared to the other region. So we could say, and it's more obvious in the second scenario, and we could say this is uh, as postulated or as said by some studies that countries within this region are to benefit more from trade facilitation. So on, it, on the trade aspects, we add uh, a positive uh, uh, growth in the value of merchandise exports for all the countries. But we could see that when we look at uh, Kenya, it was almost uh, like it's doubled or more than double. Same uh, also for Tanzania, it was the change was significant in both scenarios. But we could see that in Sri Lanka, the first scenario, which involved tariff, tariff uh, reduction cuts, was uh, much more uh, higher than the second scenario, which involved NTM and uh, trade facilitation. So the same thing also occurs for Mozambique. Going further to the imports as well, the imports follow the same trend just as the, uh, the exports, where, where we see Kenya uh, and Tanzania having a good uh, amounts of increase in the value of merchandise imports. And we also witnessed the same in Sri Lanka and uh, Mozambique, where the first scenario is much impactful than the second uh, scenario. In terms of capital accumulation, all the countries in the region had uh, a significant increase in their capital accumulation as compared to the uh, baseline, which is the open regionalism scenario. We, we could see that uh, it's much more uh, in countries like Sri Lanka and Kenya. And also it is no, it's noted to, to also show that country like Mauritius has a lot of significant increase in capital accumulation when there is NTM removal uh, and uh, trade facilitation. So uh, while we were doing our study, we, we had to come up with some issues. We had to deal with some issues of capital accumulation. So we decided to go for a second model, apart from the run dinner, which is the GTAB RD. So, and we looked at the dynamic parts. We discovered that the run dinner in absolute terms uh, is, uh, shows a lower capital accumulation compared to the run, uh, to the run dinner. So, and when countries are singled out, the impacts could be more, uh, could be more glaring where you could see some differences among some countries uh, between developed and developing countries. On the GDP aspects, we, the, the run dinam tends to show a higher GDP impact than the GTAP RD for some countries involved in the scenario. So the run dinam takes into account international transfer of capital. It turns out that uh, the perspective in the run dinam is better suited to more possible FDI inflows due to the FTA. In other words, in, an, in all countries where FDI are relevant, the GTAP would RD, the GTAB RD model would underestimate the impact of the GDP growth. Also, we notice that GTAB RD show a higher GDP impact for Australia and India, but why for Australia it is consistent with the higher capital accumulation as shown in the previous slide. That's, but for India, the capital accumulation is bigger in their own dynamic. It seems these two models might have different response to, between developed and developing uh, nations. So these are uh, modeling issues which we would rather call for comments and suggestions. So moving forward, so we could see that uh, that in terms of trade, the capital inflows from equity uh, changes the trade picture. They, they run the run showing a higher export change for countries involved in the, in the scenario. But we could see some uh, like uh, ambiguous change when we look at countries like China, USA, Jap uh, Japan, which show some opposite uh, impacts. We, we could see similar trend in the import side as well, but same where the non dinam has an a higher impact on exports uh, compared to the GTAB RD. So to conclude this modeling 
aspect, uh, we could say we could we are saying or we are so we are we are like looking at that the own denim, which include equity from abroad, can overestimate the trade impact due to lack of international capital reallocation. GitHub RD can underestimate the GitHub uh, the GDP impact. It also seems that uh, the parameterization in both models is not consistent with the differences between developing and developed nations since results are puzzled when comparing these two categories. So it should, should one DNAM and GitHub RD be used in different analysis? So these are, are they substitutes for each other? So to conclude my uh, presentation, I would uh, say that uh, the open regionalism, which the IORA presently runs, is uh, would be better off when they go for a deeper integration, which involves a tariff cut coupled with uh, NTM reduction and trade facilitation. Thank you, and your contributions and comments are welcome. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Abdullah, for uh, this very interesting and and provocative presentation as well, because you you are coming with an interesting result saying that depending on the kind of model, you do not get the same kind of results. So it's uh, very interesting. So at least, you know, it provides some areas of discussion regarding which model, which data, and how to capture these kind of scenarios in, in the right way and are they substitute or any other complementary approaches. Uh, I will come to, to my comment later on, but before that, uh, I would give the floor to, to Nassim if he has uh, any comments uh, on, on your presentation. Nassim, please. Yes, yeah, th th thanks, uh, Mustafa, and uh, thanks also, Amla, for your presentation. Uh, yeah, a lot of questions. Uh, the paper analyzes how open regionalism measures uh, contributing to reduce uh, monetary measures could amplify trade and economic impact in the IORA region. Explores two, two scenarios depending on regionalism in the IORA region. Um, scenario one evaluates the effect of like, gradual tariff cuts in the region, while the, the second scenario combines the impact of tariff cuts, non-tariff measures, reduction and trade facilitation. So the the uh, yeah just to 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 remind the different scenarios. The first one is tariff cut gradual over ten year ten years period with the IORA in a reciprocal relaxation, and the second one is the same is the scenario one plus fifty percent of reduction in tariff measures and trade facilitation measures. So the paper exposed the non-tariff measure dimension in, the, in the deeper integration that involves reduction of NTMs that are considered as inefficient non-tariff measures and uh, NTM harmonization. Indeed, since the Bali WTO military conference, the trade facilitation agreement, WFA, non-tariff measures uh, has received more attention in trade agreements, and particularly in deepening regional integration processes as trade facilitation and non-tariff uh, barriers are interrelated. Using dynamic uh, CG model, which is an extension of the static feedback model, the, the authors provide mainly welfare impact of the uh, IORA region with the uh, and without trade facilitation measures. Uh, in the simulation, non-tariff measures are reduced by 50%, but it is not clear uh, for me how tariff trade facilitation measures are implemented and what is the ad valorem equivalent in this uh, uh, in the implementation of the tariff uh, trade facilitation. So perhaps a clarification on, on that aspect would be, would be, would be really welcome. In the absolute value, the results are interesting and the big trade actors like as India, Indonesia, the Australia have bigger impacts. But surprisingly, the difference between the scenario one and scenario two 
are small in the great majority of the countries, except for Kenya, perhaps, on the, in, on Tanzania, perhaps, uh, compared to similar results in other papers relating to non tariff measures on the trade participation reductions. So I was, yeah, a little, little bit surprised by the, the fact that the difference was that small. And perhaps there are also uh, uh, more explanations and comparisons, uh, at least in the literature, uh, is needed. One of the main results of the paper is that the countries within the region, within the region that belong to lower middle income and low income, would benefit more from reduction in non-tariff measures coupled with the trade facilitation. This is an important result. And the reader is expecting an analysis of the reasons behind that. So on that aspect, really an effort should be made to, 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 to explain why we have this very significant difference, or at least some element of explanation. Uh, this is even more interesting when we consider that this is more pronounced for lower middle, uh, lower middle income countries compared to LDCs. So you have kind of, uh, of uh, inverse U curve, or, but definitely there is something to, 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 to deepen there. Uh, interesting result for Kenya and Mauritius uh, in one side, and Sri Lanka and Mozambique in the other side. Why, why such? kind of significant difference. Uh, for the late, latest for um, uh, Sri Lanka and Mozambique, why, uh, 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 why, 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 why they export less when non-tariff measures are refused and trade facilitation measures are implemented? Uh, is it because of their sectoral specialization or because they are in competition in very specific markets? with specific competitors. So, I mean, this is a, 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 a surprising result. So it definitely it, it needs uh, more, more, uh, more explanation. Uh, and I'm sure that there are reasons for, 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 for these results. Huh? So, but uh, yeah, one should uh, find uh, at least some explanation on, on that. Another interesting result in the paper is that East Asia and India Having greatest welfare gains with a scenario that impacts trade costs through implementation of, of trade facilitation measures. And the difference with African and West Asian IORA countries is really significant. Uh, and here again, an analysis could be useful. Of course, we have a, vo a volume effect, but not only. One of the questions. One of the questions would be, in fact, do we have here a sectoral effect with an export specialization of Asian countries on goods that are more sensitive to non-tariff measures and to trade facilitation measures compared to the African ones? So also, uh, I, I, I'm convinced that the, uh, uh, there is an explanation on, on this uh, very significant uh, difference and uh, the, the paper will gain uh, in this, uh, the, uh, exploring uh, what is behind this uh, significant uh, uh, difference. So you have many, many, many things to explore, the comparison between the two, the two models also and the, the, the difference, uh, significant difference between the results. So, uh, I, I, uh, I'm sure that uh, the, you'll be very busy the, the next weeks because the, the, these are very interesting results. And the paper is very interesting and uh, we gain a lot uh, by bringing this some, some uh, additional uh, explanation to, to, to these questions. Thanks uh, a lot, uh, Thanks, Mustafa. Over to you. Hello, Nassim. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's, it's extremely uh relevant and comprehensive what, what you mentioned, particularly on uh, the magnitude of the results, uh, the differentiation that uh, we may have. Um, I also had some, some similar questions, particularly on, on the welfare gain and on the production gains. 
uh, due to the scenario two. Uh, I think it would be quite interesting maybe to, 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 to look at uh, other threat facilitation indicators and try to decompose uh, the threat facilitation indicator to see where the gains are coming from, particularly when you want to reduce uh, non-tariff measures and uh, also maybe to get uh, the ad valorem equivalence in your, in your, in your um, estimates. And I suspect that uh, uh, the difference of results uh, could also be explained by the way you have uh, endogenized uh, those variables in your in your work. So it won't maybe a problem regarding the kind of models, but maybe more a problem regarding the nature of the data uh, used and the advarium equivalents that have been used, particularly to capture threat facilitation reduction or other uh, measures such as uh, SPS or other 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 uh, elements. Interestingly, also the I was quite surprised to see uh, not surprised but interesting to see uh, such a magnitude of results uh, for very specific number of countries like uh, Sri Lanka, Kenya, mainly uh, where the results compared to scenario one and two are very very. Uh, uh, important. Uh, so it would be interesting uh, to, to get more insight on, on, on this specific aspect uh, as well. Uh, well, I've taken the floor to ask questions because I don't see any uh, colleagues or participants who want to, to raise questions or to um, yeah, uh, suggest any, any inputs in what was presented by Abdullah. So if there is no additional comments, I would just continue uh, and take the freedom of being the chair to ask maybe one or two additional questions uh, regarding uh, what I believe is a result of the paper, uh, the nature of the model impact, the nature of the results. And if so, uh, then uh, I think that the model you have been using for this kind of exercise is probably not the right one that should be used to analyze it. So my question here is, what kind of alternative approach are you suggesting in order to capture uh, this uh, uh, analytical work you have provided? And also, my second question is much more regarding the baseline you have used. I also uh, uh, suspect that the baseline could capture a more dynamic effect uh, due to ongoing agreements or impact or implementation of agreements uh, uh, so that the nature of the differences uh, between uh, the two models are uh, mitigated or at least reduced. Uh, because if you take in your benchmark uh, all the dynamic impact of ongoing agreements or ongoing effect of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, impact of measures such as a trade facilitation agreement or the reduction of tariff barriers, or implementation of other other elements, I do believe that uh, the magnitude of the results will be narrowed down, and therefore one aspect of your conclusion will be at least uh, attenu attenuated. So, uh, uh, in a nutshell, those are question comments, much more uh, also from from a technical point of view. Uh, I think also it would be great to get more insight about what are the policy implications of your work. Uh, because you have such an heterogeneity uh, of countries in your in your in your uh, uh, analytical work and in the uh, Indian Ocean Rim uh, Association. So my point here is: How do you ensure consistency of commitments taken by specific countries in one agreement, and how do you make sure that those uh, modalities taken in uh, uh, IORA are very much also, uh, let's say? Uh, consistent with other uh, modalities or other uh, uh, agreements. And that's why I was saying that the baseline is something important that needs to be very much, you know, um, consolidated or at least uh, explained so that, you know, uh, uh, we can be much more confident in the nature of, of the conclusion you came with regarding uh, the nature of the model which impact uh, your, your results. I think I will stop here and um, 
Abdullah, over to you maybe to provide some, some comments or, or clarifications on the questions and comments raised. Thanks. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mustafa and, uh, and Asim for your comments and uh, impacts. So probably let me start with uh, the, about NCMs and TF implemented in, in GitHub. So what's, what we did is uh, we, we made use of, of the AMS to implement the, the NCM and the, uh, the tariff facilitation. So we made use of AVEs, which are obtained for countries from uh, EETOL 2016, which is a uh, which estimate for different countries. So that was that was how we we made use of the uh, we, we implemented the NCM and tariff facilitation. So there are like three different methods to implement uh, NCMs in uh, presently three different methods. Either we take it as export tax. We take it as uh, take it as imports uh, tax, uh, import tariff, or we we, we use the uh, the AMS uh, efficiency efficiency the iceberg the uh, iceberg method. So for our study, we went for the top the third method, which is using the uh, the iceberg efficiency uh, method. So for the welfare, so like. If you check on the slide, yeah, usually we, we, we put like a, a warning that this this part of the welfare should be treated with caution because uh, the it is not that straightforward to do the welfare gain in the dynamic model. You have to have to, you have to do like a post uh, analysis, take different uh, the last year or compared to the static method where you can just have an EV. They are taking a uh, button directly. So we we'll welcome suggestions, comments on how to improve the welfare results. So, but however, when we check the compositions for some countries like Bangladesh and others which had uh, uh, a, a negative welfare, we noticed that uh, the welfare loss was uh, the contribution came mostly from, uh, let's say, investments. Uh, uh, allocative efficiency, and also from the terms of trades of these countries. So that was where we got the uh, the welfare loss from. Then also, yeah, it's, it's still a thing of concern. Still looking at how Sri Lanka and Mozambique are having uh, a different, uh, uh, like a a much higher uh, results in like the imports and the exports. In the scenario one, com uh, when compared to scenario two, so it's an area we will still have to dig deep to uh, to check. So in terms of the the baseline, so basically we we just made use of the GitHub version A 10A, which we believe to an extent has captured uh, a lot of uh, agreements between countries to the recent time except for recent agreements such as uh, the African continental trade uh, area, which might not be ca captured in this. So the business scenario captured, uh, well, I'd say to an extent, a lot of these uh, ag agreements. Then also, uh, I would rather say that instead of looking for an, an alternative uh, method, so I, I would suggest because as we, we've done in the past uh, a study which looked at the uh, the trade determinants in the region, which we've made use of a gravity uh, model. So I would also suggest uh, that a CG would be suitable for this approach because it's going to look at all all, all other uh, all other contribute, uh, contributors to an economy, not just from a partial perspective, but from a more comprehensive. Uh, approach. So that's why we are making use of uh, a CG uh, model. So I guess those are uh, some of the, then on the sectoral uh, output, like you said, more sensitive uh, uh, sectors. Yes, I agree with that. So uh, one has to look at which area, uh, area sectors are like more sensitive when it comes to 
to NCMs and get facilitation in uh, uh, like comparing Asia and Africa. So I feel those are still some of my uh, my feedback or comments to the questions that have been have been raised. Then in terms of in terms of the model, so uh, we're still open to a lot of uh, a lot of uh, comments or further work because we are comparing between Rondinam and uh, GTAB RD to to see if they respond to uh, the analysis in a different method. So more comments, more suggestions will be welcomed in this area, maybe to improve the way we went about the uh, the uh, the simulations in terms of in terms of the shocks and in terms of the uh, the implementation. So those are the things I could I could say now. Okay. No, thank you very much, Abdullah. I think it's uh, it's quite interesting and it's also a work in progress. But uh, at least you 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 came with very what I believe uh, interesting results. And maybe the, the the way forward is much more to capture uh, additional elements such as the one made by uh, by Nassim and Ohai on 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 um, what I call specificities of the modeling exercise and particularly on the choice of, of the model. So thank you very much, Abdullah, for uh, your presentation and comment. Uh, we thank were you supposed very to much. have a third, we were, no, thank you to you. We were supposed to have a third paper from a, a colleague from University of uh, Abome Calavi. Uh, I don't think it's connected. So in that case, I think we are arriving to the end of the session. Uh, until uh, or unless we have any additional comments or things that colleagues want to want to say, uh, if not, uh, maybe just to wrap up a little bit the the session. I think we have uh, two very interesting papers. Uh, the first one uh, on trade and climate change, and particularly. Uh, how the, the development of regional value chains could uh, uh, have um, and, and, and trade openness, trade liberalization could have, you know, uh, environmental effects and the importance to, to, to have environmental uh, regulations uh, into trade agreements to support and build, uh, let's say, greener better. I see if I can say like this, uh, uh, instead of being forward better, being greener better. And uh, I think that what was mentioned, particularly on the various agreements, including the CFTA, how to capture this dimension and how to use uh, the recovery plans, particularly uh, in the world after the COVID-19, to, to make sure that we could also have this kind of uh, resilient re recovery, particularly uh, in line uh, of the uh, COP26. That is going to be organized by the end of the year. So I think the paper was very relevant and, and timely. Fortunately, we won't add the paper from uh, Benin and the topic was also very much related to this aspect of how to address and mitigate, uh, or at least how to, to, to include, you know, a trade, I, I mean, how, how the trade policy could be used also to mitigate the impact of environment. I think that the paper that uh, uh, Charlemagne and, and his colleagues was supposed to to present um, uh, was a, uh, an essay or an attempt to uh, address this uh, this issue. Uh, the second paper from uh, Abdallah also provided very uh, topical and interesting uh, analytical work applied to the uh, IORA regarding how uh, addressing uh, non-tariff measures, non-tariff barriers, particularly uh, trade facilitation. Uh, could also amplify the impact of uh, uh, trade deals into productions. Uh, but interestingly, your paper was also an attempt to show that the kind of model modeling uh, used to assess uh, those scenarios uh, have also impact not only on the short term, but on the long term. And the dynamic uh, assessment of uh, those agreements needs to uh, be well uh, Let's say capture in uh, in in um, uh, the model and uh, in in 
in the assumption made behind uh, the modeling exercise. So uh, it's particularly relevant as well, uh, given the fact that IORA uh, uh, encapsulates many countries from, from many continents, and it shows also the impact that uh, uh, trade gains could have uh, at, at the regional and, and, and global level in addition of the national level. Uh, I'm not going to 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 say what I was saying or what uh, Nassim and colleagues were saying during during the presentation. So if I don't see any additional comments, I will just maybe give the floor back to uh, maybe uh, Nassim and then Martin for uh, a quick uh, closing uh, remarks, and then I think we can we can close the session. So maybe Nassim, if you want to say a few words, and then I will give the I will give the the word of the hand to uh, Martin. Uh, we close, we close the, the, the session. Nassim? Thanks, Mustafa. Not much to, to, to add. Huh? Just, just uh, as you highlighted the, the importance of the, the context of the COP26 coming in October, uh, in Glasgow this October, so uh, the COVID crisis and the, the, the building for a better and greener. So the focus of the, the of, of this of the decision was uh, uh, tiny and very, uh, and very relevant. And thanks uh, again to 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 uh, and uh, uh, sorry for <laughs> time uh, uh, giving to Insaf and Abdullah for the uh, excellent presentation. And uh, I give you back the floor to Martin. Thank you very much. I don't want to get into problems with Waja, so I will just uh, thank everybody for the excellent presentations. For Mustafa for having chaired this in an uh, outstanding manner and for uh, the interest taken. And we see that the quality of the papers is really uh, outstanding, I would say. There's a bit of more work to be done here and there. I hope you will benefit from the suggestions and hopefully you will get more from other colleagues. And uh, I would really like to end by expressing my thanks again to uh, the organizers of this uh, GTAP conference and uh, from Mustafa and Nassim for giving very pertinent, excellent comments and observations. And um, Let's uh, continue working together on these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nassim. Thank you, Martin. Uh, also, let me thank all the participants, uh, more particularly uh, our speakers today, uh, Insaf uh, and, uh, and Abdallah. Uh, also, uh, thank uh, Waja for uh, moderating, at least, you know, uh, helping us to moderate the, 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 the time from, uh, from VTAP. And also want to thank all the participants uh, of, um, of this session. Um, I think it's important to make sure that um, uh, jazz program, WTO, and, and uh, also the technical work provided by ECA uh, is well represented uh, uh, during the, the, the GTAP conference. Uh, we uh, uh, had organized many sessions during the last years. Uh, in, in Colombia, three years ago, two years ago, it was uh, in Poland. Uh, last year it was online due to the COVID-19, this year is still online, and hopefully next year uh, in, uh, in, in Rwanda, inshallah, uh, for, for the next conference that EC is going also to co-host, uh, not to preempt the conclusion uh, of, the, of, the, of the conference tomorrow, but you know that the last session of the detailed conference is usually to give a flavor about where the conference is going to be organized next year, so um, I'm not going to to, to, to say it officially, but you, you, you may be all aware that uh, EC is going to co-host it uh, uh, next year and uh, hopefully we'll try to, to organize such a session uh, with, with the uh, academic community uh, of uh, the, the, the WTO, I mean, within the outreach uh, pillar, but also uh, with Nassim and, and colleagues from ECA. We have other sessions in the program, particularly with IFPRI and the ATPC. Uh, on the on the trade modeling and other sessions, so I would also invite you maybe to attend those sessions. It uh, it based on the research and papers uh, done by uh, uh, African scholars uh, and uh, mentored by uh, senior experts, uh, including from IFPRI from ECA uh, during during the last year. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, session as well, and I do encourage you to to attend if your respective agenda allows. So uh, I think I will stop here with uh, maybe uh, 20 minutes advance, but at least we had two very great papers. Thank you very much all. Uh, please 
uh, we we'll also extend our appreciation to Ginger and all the colleagues from GitHub. And uh, if there is no additional comments, I think I will stop the session here. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice day or evening forward for those being in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.